was a soldier of good fortune. There was just this enormous purity. He was a maverick in a world filled with mules. It's the team players who make the money, but it's the mavericks who make the medium. He said, just don't be afraid of anything and don't be afraid of anyone. Never quit. Never give up. Guts. That was gone. Los Angeles, March 25, 1993. Dear Jenna, time has come so that I think the moment appropriate to write you this letter. Although I was planning to ask you if I could interview you during our stay at San Sebastian, I thought it was maybe better to wait for this occasion. I'm ready now to start my documentary on John Cassavetes, a film about an era when Hollywood was into real filmmaking. I was a woman with a plan. I knew the only thing that could really stop me, in my opinion, was to fall in love. Mm. You have to realize this is a long time ago. In those days, if you got married and had children, you, you quit whatever you were doing. So I thought, all right, I want to be an actress badly enough that I will just forego the comfort of love. And I'll be very careful not to expose myself to it. <laughs> About the goose that went down into the subway. <laughs> I went in at lunch to put my books in a locker. And I got to the doorway and, and I saw John Cassavetes. And I thought, oh, oh, damn. No, 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 no. No, this is just exactly what I don't want. John did not believe in plot, believed in character. If you go deep into character, you'll get your plot. Stay with the people, you know? Stay with their lives. There's more drama and difficulties for people living a day-to-day -day existence or the final of their days. There's enough drama in that alone. I decided to make a documentary on John Cassavetes because of his impact on independent filmmaking and his importance as the absolute rebel maverick, financing and distributing an impressive list of personal movies. Come on in. Come on in. You know what I was thinking about? I was thinking about uh, my life. I was thinking about the opening. John Cassavetes was born in New York in 1929 as a son of Greek parents. He started his career in the mid-50s as a film and television actor after scholarship at the American Academy of Dramatic Arts, strongly influenced by the actor studio. <laughs> I first met him. I think it must have been about 50. I was at the studio, and we were on an experiment. I was not an actor, but I was with Kazan doing experimental things. There was an experiment called Actors Freedom, and I saw this experiment on actors' freedom. So Tennessee Williams, Kazan, myself, we throw out a word to the actor and the actress. And they would do something, improvise, with actors' freedom. It was very painful. It was very painful psychological and technical experiment. So I left, went to the theater, there was a young man uh, during the theater break doing backflips, uh, somersaults in a big empty theater, declaiming 
Plato, Aristophanes, Shakespeare, sonnets, street talk, improvising all this in a big collage of sound. And this was the most perfect example of actor's freedom I had ever seen. I had seen him do two or three television shows, and I was very impressed with his acting. I called him and asked him if he would come to my office to talk to me. And he did. And I said, are you sure that you're qualified and that you can act? And he ju jumped out of his chair and he grabbed my shirt. And these were the days where we had tie pins. And you had a tie pin tying your, your shirt and your tie so to hold it together. Well, he pulled my tie and my shirt so the tie pin held and my shirt ripped in half and came off my shoulders. I was half naked by virtue of his, of his saying, God damn it, I'm one of the best actors living. Give me a chance. <laughs> John is a stormy petrol. He was in the middle of a hurricane. When you met, you're never on time. But we'll make it. I think he became a director because he had something to say. Uh, he had a vision. No, we gotta make it. Come on, come on, come on. Oh, man, it's too late. Look, 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 you stop it. Come on, man, run. Oh, back in 19... early 1958, there was a, a show on radio called Night People. It was Gene Shepard who had this show, who was the satirist. And he was very popular. He was very hip in those days, uh, and he had a, a very strong following. All right, folks, that's it. After last night's show, no more long messages. Just a short, quick line of, you want to talk to me? Leave your name, leave your number, I'll get back to you. You want to fetch me, do that. And if you don't want to do anything, hang up. And I'll still find out who you want. See more? And it's just like any radio talk show today. They, they, you know, they talk about, would you, uh, would you take a million dollars for your wife to uh, go to bed with Robert Redford? Sure. Get, what, what, honey, we've been married seven years. I'd go do it. Get the money. It was that kind of show, radio show, where you could talk for a long time, and the, you know, no one was saying, quickly, quickly, go to, to, go to the commercial. It was one of a very nice, relaxed show. So John told him, this improvisation that they'd been doing uh, about this uh, racial family, this racial uh, problem and uh, with this family. And uh, Gene got very excited. He said, God, he said, this is, he said, why aren't movies like this? And John said, yeah, why aren't they? And um, so uh, he said, well, he said, why don't you do it? And John said, Got, got a couple million dollars, I'll, I'll do it. I guess that Gene Shepard said, well, you folks, you hear that. If you want to support uh, an enterprising proposition, just send your money in or whatever. Something to that effect in a kind of dismissive way, but nicely. And uh, within two weeks, several thousand dollars came in. So John was hooked. Now he had to make the picture. He had no choice. Tell me you will always be mine. Shadows was totally improvised. That's how they started out. And then after that, of course, everyone thought everything was improvised. We worked very hard to make it look spontaneous. But they were actually scripted. Captain, don't, don't touch me. Come on, just a little taste. <laughs> To him, Shadows was a youthful adventure. He wanted to go into human life. And even the approach film, 
not as a highly polished technique, not Eisenstein, not perfect photography. Life is not perfect photography. I don't want you around hurting my sister. I don't want you to hurt anything of mine. Now go. Just get out. You're telling me to get out. Get out, man. What do you want me to do now? Just get out. Remember, you, you told me to get out. Look, look. Would you, would you leave? You leave before I do something I don't want to do right now. You just get out of here. Go ahead. But you remember, you told me to get out of here. Will you get out of the house? It was the first time that an American had taken on middle-class society and just said, you know, these are people, this is what happens. Judge for yourself. Will you shut up? What'd I say? Just, just forget it. No, forget it. What did I say? What's the matter with her? Nothing you'd be interested in. It would not, look, she's my sister, too. I want to know what's the matter with her. Nothing, baby. Just a little problem that came up last night. A little problem. What is the little problem? Look, Benny, it's just, just a problem to racist. That's all. I think it's worth noting that, uh... In terms of John's originality, in terms of the fact that uh, there was no one quite like him, and his place in filmmaking is uh, is a very unique one. I think it. Uh, I think it's worth noting that uh, years before anybody ever heard of Martin Luther King, at a time when blacks were still riding in the back of the bus in the South. A young man in his 20s deciding to make his first picture, made a picture about a black and white relationship. Someone said that John saw the dawn an hour before anybody else. And that's true. Look, David, I am what I am. And nobody tells me what to do. I don't know who you think you're fighting. You know, I saw the way he looked at you back there. And I also saw the way he looked at me. Nobody wanted shadows in the United States. Uh, it was considered too provocative too grainy, too amateurish, too, too everything. After Shadows, John Cassavetes is offered to make Too Late Blues and A Child Is Waiting. The road leads to Hollywood. Hollywood, da -dee -da 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 -dee -da 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 -da. Hollywood, I need a job, I need a call. Tell me, do you need me at all? You know, you're not you know that? <laughs> My nuts, what are you talking about? <laughs> John is a little crazy, too. He loved being wild. I think he realized that there was no way that he could operate within the studio system. Uh, he wanted to make... John was an original. He was an original not only in form, but in content. What he wanted to say, and the way he wanted to say it, had never been done before. And people didn't understand it. They always wanted him as an actor. They would never finance his type of picture which they didn't understand and which also ran into two hours, 20 minutes. But they admired him. They were suspicious of him as a director. Um, and, uh, you know, John had a couple of arguments, let's put it mildly, with the 
producers. Was, I love that about him. He didn't ever compromise. And uh, so many times in your daily life, in your yearly life, and, and as the years go by, you compromise. You're forced with situations to compromise so many times that uh, I do believe I, I, I never saw the man compromise what was really indigenous to his character. And never saw him. Never happened once. You know, he once said, and I, I agree, with, I, I, I know it's true, he said, uh, I'd rather work in a sewer than make a picture I don't like. And that was it. He didn't like the pictures that they had. And he didn't like them because they, they wanted him to make it their way. Oil and water it wouldn't mix. A Child is Waiting it was really a very sensitive story. Kramer was a producer. He changed John's editing. I was there when that happened, and John just scared him a little bit. Grabbed him by the throat, like that, and said, take my name off the film. So he's blacklisted from making movies for about two years. So he stayed home, and he wrote about God knows how many scripts. Instead of a five-picture deal for Paramount Pictures, Casaveris chooses for the hardship of independent, low-budget filmmaking. With Faces, he proves to be back with the cinema of the uppercut, on the way to personal films. You look lousy. Not in a good mood. Anything I can do for you? I'll give you a list of my maladies. You better give me a cup of coffee. I don't want to yawn in Mrs. Miller's face. Yes, sir. Hmm? It just took a long, long time. It took four years. Here you are. Will you take this thing out of my mouth? Okay. Thanks. Faces was a major breakthrough for independent films. In America. And to see faces when it came out in those years, you saw acting that you hadn't seen before. You never saw anything with that kind of spontaneity, that kind of behavior. And the emotions were so raw, and the rhythms were different. There were no cliches in John's pictures. There wasn't a shot that was a cliche. There wasn't a scene that was a cliche. There wasn't an emotion or a piece of behavior that was a cliche. Uh, he certainly wasn't interested in, in a conventional boy meets girl uh, success story type movie. Uh, there's slices of life, raw. Very strong, very Greek. Yeah, I want right. boss. <laughs> Thank you. Did you hear what I said? <laughs> broken up society that John was showing. This jagged style of presentation that he had was in keeping with the society he was reflecting. A society that's out of control and upside down.
I'm not sure that he always knew where we were going. But there was such faith in our ability to, to master the moment. It really was a pursuit of discovery. What do I think? I think I, think, I, think I don't know nothing. He, he, was, he was, sometimes he was like a wild man, like a, like a wild animal. But at the same time, his family was at the very center of his universe. So he housed all these contradictions. And uh, he was, yeah, John was, was an artist, and John was a, a romantic, and he had, uh, he was a visionary, but he was a tough son of a bitch, I'll tell you that. He was a terrific negotiator. And he could take a dime and he could stretch it into ten dollars. I mean, he could make pictures for nothing. We did run out of money all of the time. And then we'd go, and that's when John started acting um, and you know, using his money and, and the money that I made acting too, and we'd put it in the film. So it took a long time getting it in and out of the lab and doing the sound, and then finally, you know, several years, the whole process. I had been recutting faces, and it was getting depressing being away from home, and, and Jenna's mother, Lady Rollins, was coming to John's house, and she always brought her dog, which was this toy uh, poodle, French poodle which uh, was quite old, and I hated this dog. And, uh, and I think he hated me, too. But in any case, uh, we went and had dinner. And when we came back, there was this terrible smell in the cutting room. And because of the sloppy way, the lack of discipline, I had film that was not in the bins, but out of the bins, across the floor, was everywhere in the editing room. And this dog had diarrhea. And so uh, he went to the bathroom, and, uh, and, and I think on purpose, went to the bathroom on all this film. So uh, that, for me, was it. That was the crowning point. I said, that's it, John. I'm getting on a plane tomorrow. I'm going home. I, I really can't take this anymore. And John was was quite desperate himself. He kept saying, you can't leave out, you can't hear. Look, look, I'll clean this up. And when I saw him get down on his hands and knees and get this film and all that dog's poop and everything, it really made me think, here's a guy who's willing to do anything. How could I leave? Uh, I wasn't convinced, but that's what I was thinking. And he went into the bathroom and I could hear the water running and then suddenly he broke out in this hysterical laugh. And so when he came out, he said, look, even dogs are critics. And he held up this film and I guess the acid in the dog's excrement had taken away all the emulsion off the film, so it had all turned to clear leader. All right, I don't roll it. When people know there's no money, and you're just all working for the love of it, just because you want to do it, there's no advantage to you. It's, it's not an ambition move. It's not expecting to make a million dollars from it afterwards. It's nothing except wanting to be there doing it. When you don't have enough, perhaps, to do the things you would like to do, you have to invent ways of getting what you want. You know, it really causes the creative juices to come out of you if you're that interested in what you're doing. And he was, and we were. Yeah, so we would try all sorts of things. And if we didn't have the money, we would try every way we could to get it for nothing. But it's hard to get your picture out of the lab. And to, the lab people have, to, have no mercy. You know what I think? I think we were all created evil. And some, or some wise guy, some, uh, a left winger or a, a union organizer comes along and tells us that we all were created good. We were all created in his image. Right? Wrong. Three years ago, the big deal was to make a film that made $100 million in grosses. Now that's not enough. They want to make a film that makes $200 million. You know, so it, it's really about greed. It's not about the content of the film. It's about making money. And, and I think it was John that said this. If you want 
and see a film about making money, get a, a whole bunch of money, and photograph it. Photograph it flying in the air, photograph it on a bed. Well, what is that, money? I mean, it's nothing. Does that make you like me more? Does that make, make me feel better toward you because you're richer? I have to tell you, if John had been sitting in this seat and you had asked him that, he would have just gotten right up and left. He wouldn't have even talked to you anymore. Because he said, if I'm going to make a whole movie and then people are not going to talk about the movie and the ideas and the, the passions and the things that are in it, and all they want to do is talk about money, he said they can talk to the producer. I've often said that John was very shrewd about money. He knew it was worthless. It only had one function, to buy a piece of film or rent a stage so that he could film or put up on a stage life as he saw it. You want violence? Huh? You want me to be violent? You want me to slap you across the face every time you open your mouth? That part was really for Jenna, and Jenna became pregnant. And it was a very physical part. So Jenna couldn't go through that. I hate my life. Just don't love you. So he saw a secretary on the studio lot. And he used her as the actress. Well, everybody loved to be an actress. And uh, she couldn't cry. He had to get her an emotional scene out of her. So he chased her. And she was terrified. She ran. He took a knife. And he made believe he was going to cut her up. And did she cry? And did she get a nomination? How he intensified the emotion of the moment to get her go way beyond. To get her go way beyond. Now, even Anthony Quinn, who was a dear friend of John and myself and all that, has said what he would love in a director is allow the actors to go beyond. Today's stories and pictures are not about life. They are about people's imagination, about buses blowing up and uh, motorcycles sliding and uh, the, the uh, mechanics have the action, not the actors. So I am of the opinion that uh, people, we should talk about people in motion pictures, not about uh, mechanical things. So uh, that's why I love the picture very much. Nobody cares. I, nobody has the time to be vulnerable to each other. So we just go on, you know? I mean, right away our armor comes out like a shield and goes around us and uh, we become like mechanical men. <laughs> and I called you a mechanical woman, huh? I got news. I'm so mechanical. Honey, it's absolutely ludicrous how mechanical a person can be. <laughs> I am the sexiest guy in the world. I have blonde hair. I can get all the women I want. You're waking up, aren't you? Uh huh. If he wanted you to be that person, to, to, to entertain him, you'd be doing a scene and, and you're doing, you could see him standing next to the camera going, <laughs> laughing, but biting his hand so he wouldn't ruin the sound take, you know. Or, you look over there and he'd be crying, you know. I mean, this guy, he was in the, the most incredible audience and the most honest that you could have as an actor. There would be times we'd do one take, he'd say, cut, print, all right, see, baby, I got it. And that's what you wanted. You'd die for that. He wanted you, and that's what I learned, to trust him. And specifically to trust that no matter what you did on film, if it was bad, it would never be there in the final picture. But you had to be willing to take chances, to make a fool of yourself, to look bad, not to be so safe, you know? He was aggravating. He wouldn't tell you what to do at all. 
It was his idea that once he had written the script, he picked what he considered the perfect people for the parts. Then it was theirs. And they were to come in prepared from their point of view, not to worry about the script as a whole, which is a very, you know, not many people uh, work that way. Most people say work for the good of the script. He said work for the good of your character. Do your character. Don't worry. The script will take care of itself. Get your ass down! You knew you were in the presence of somebody who had something on his mind. He had his own vision, but he was impossible because you didn't understand him. Hello. Hi, Mom. Hello, Mama. I want to strangle him. I want to strangle him. Uh, uh, you, 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 he kept you. In some ways, I think John was very wise in the sense that he deliberately tried to keep you off balance so that you wouldn't bring out your old-fashioned technique. You wouldn't bring out your old ideas. He was always trying to get rid of people's old ideas. It's tough when you're an original because you're surrounded by people who aren't. They're all nice and they're talented and you like them, but it's hard for you to hold on to your own vision. And that was his problem. And when we were making husbands, I told the story a number of times. I didn't know what the hell was going on. Peter has trouble knowing what a lot of things are about. No, I'm, okay. I'm kidding, Peter. Suddenly, I just said to him, I was trying to be polite. He said, you know, I said, John, I'll work with you again as an actor. But never, never, never. And then I exploded. Never. And I went crazy. Never as a director. I was cold. I was on top of him. <laughs> and what saved it was that Benny in the front started to laugh. <laughs> he was roaring with laughter. But it's true. It was very funny, you know, because John would explain to Peter that John hated to give a direction. You know, he, he never, never, as I know, gave a direct direction to an actor because he thought that was the killer of of, of, of uh, imagination. So he'd give you conversation about things, you know, and wh what he really meant was move over there, you see? But he'd give you a four-hour four conversation about what he meant. So I tell, I said, after P Peter said, what does he mean, what does he mean? I said, Peter, he means move over there. Just move over there, everything's gonna be all right. You know? Pictures are made to entertain and to, to be digested easily, and his are not. Is a made to, to, to shake you up and make you think and make you wonder. John's films were like John. I like John. Uh, John's films appear to be unstructured, which is absolutely extraordinary considering that they are very structured. And the more you see them, the more you realize how brilliantly constructed they are. And yet, first, many times you don't need to see his films before you realize how brilliantly hidden the construction is. John hated structure. He hated the well-made picture. He hated the story, the story, story, story picture that you get. The ones that make a lot of money, as you see. They're the only pictures that make money. Easily digestible. They go from point A to point B to point C to point B. You know, there's a, uh, a beginning, an end, a resolution. The good guy usually wins. Everybody goes home happy. He said, well, that isn't the way John looked at life. Actually, John actually was more interested 
in, in surprising behavior than he was in story. Sonny, how's it going? Well, who's on stage? Margot and Sherry. Yeah, why are only two girls on stage? Where's Teddy? He uh, just came up. All right, well, what's he singing? What song is he singing, Sonny? But how can that be? Sonny, how can that be the song with only two girls on stage? What? Sonny! Well, who's this? Vince. Vince, I can't understand Sonny. Uh, well, well, who's on stage now? The, 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 uh, the, the short girl, uh, Margot Dunn, right? And the tall girl, right? Sherry. Yeah. And uh, what, what number is it? Is it the Paris number? The Paris number, for Christ's sake. You've been at the place seven years. You don't know what the Paris number is? Well, are there signs on the wall? P-A-R. The Paris number. Are there letters on the wall that say P-A-R? There's another card that says Moon. Well, what's he singing? Is it I can't give you anything but love, baby? I can't give you anything but love, baby. You know, the wonderful rapport you have with actors in John's films is that you could see them listening to you. Hello? Hello? You could see them really hearing you and enjoying you. Damn telephones. But there are other actors, you talk to them and you go, hello? Hey, anybody there? Oh, you're thinking about what you're going to say. Huh? You're not listening. Oh, you're close up. That's what you're in. Oh, uh, it's going to be beautiful. Don't worry. They'll put a filter on you, make you look 10 years younger, and you can just bullshit your way through this. You know, instead of being honest. Come in. Hello? Hello? Nick, it's the city. They need you. Tell him I'm not coming in. He said he's not coming in. Tell him I'm not Superman. What the hell did I think I am? Superman? He says he's not Superman. What the heck do you think he is, Superman? What did you do? You hung up? In every picture he ever made, he's dealing with man's need for love and the fact that for whatever reasons, because we're stupid, because we're greedy, because we're jealous, because we're small, because we're superstitious, because we're ignorant, God knows what. We want it, we struggle for it, we don't always get it. Love is hard. I'm down here now, I love you. It's fine, Nick. please believe me, it's fine. You all right? Yeah. Maybe I'm going to make this up to you. I'm not going to work tomorrow. Come on, you I'm going to take the day off tomorrow, and we're going to be together tomorrow. All day. All right, sweetheart? Yeah. OK, sweetheart. You're my girl. Hey, good. Come on, Nick. Come on. Get on there. Come on. Oh. Represented the style of actuality. People behaving as they would normally behave in life and not pretending to play a role, but behaving as they would be behaving in their living room, in a car, on a street, wherever he chose to place them. He was a, a style of naturalism. 
which I think was the, the, the highlight of his, of his career and his, his, the, the mark he left on the business. and the art and what was going on dictated the movie. And that usually the script dictates the movie or what you're going to shoot that day. There was a form, and this was free form. And uh, I don't think of it, no American was doing free form then to my knowledge. And now every independent filmmaker is trying to copy that. The movies aren't as easily accessible to the, the regular audience. It's not like a TV situation comedy. It's life. Life was an intense thing with him. Get out of here! Stop Get out! Me. I'll kill you and your kids! Stop it! Stop it! Get out of here! Stop it! Stop he would write and rewrite and rewrite that story in his head and tell it to everybody he met. Everyone. From the guy who delivered the groceries to, you know, to the gardeners, to, to everybody. To everybody. If he had an opportunity to tell the story that particular part he was working on, he would tell it and he would just watch your reaction. And he had this habit which probably, if you'd speak to anybody, Seymour or Sam Schroeder, that if you slept in his house, there were no locks on the doors. And you'd be asleep, and suddenly you'd wake up, and he'd be on the foot of your bed, sort of mid-conversation, going, and if we make the movie, I don't know where we're going to shoot it. Are we going to shoot it outside? And you'd say, I'm sleeping. He goes, that's OK. And he'd disappear, and he'd come in and out all night, because he couldn't sleep, really. About 3 o'clock at night, he'd he'd wake up. He'd say, Johnny, you wait. And he'd say, yeah. He'd say, you know that scene where we're... And then we'd you know, we'd be gone talking about it again. And you'd come downstairs for a glass of milk, and he'd say, Nick, sit down. I want to talk to you about something. And you'd go, Dad, I need some sleep. I'm going to go to, I got to get up in the morning. And I said, just, just one second, just one second. What do you think? And then by the time, and he could hook you in. And by the time, you'd be arguing, screaming, yelling. And it would be 5 o'clock in the morning, and Mom would come downstairs saying, go to bed. What are you doing? And what, just one more thing. I missed that period, um, although it almost killed me greatly the seven or eight years we were together. I mean, he came to town and he dominated my life. He'd come in here and he would say, come on, we're going to go over to the hospital and visit Sam's wife. Then we're going to go over to here. We're going to... And it was a running party that went on and on. And I wouldn't give it up for anything in the world, but it's, it was something. And uh, he wasn't like anybody else. He was like as big as the room he was in. And, and he, everybody gravitated toward him. Well. Yes, he was impossible. But then we all were impossible. <coughs> well. John always had the extreme wisdom of a, an, an intuitive sense of what was right that comes with somebody who seems to be crazy, you know? Say something really off the wall, and John will say, they do that all the time, say something really off the wall. You really, had to th you really had to think about what he meant before you, you know, sometimes he'd say something and say, what? Why don't you just do this? Jesus, John, I don't know how the hell you do that. You can do it. Um, I, he had a big mouth. I mean, he was in a fast temper. He was a volatile person. What the hell are you trying to prove? Give me, huh? What are you trying to prove? You're acting like some grade school theatrical kid, for Christ's sake. Everybody loves you. He had an extraordinary, I'm what? indomitable I'm spirit, what? A, a youthful kind of anger and I don't know what the hell rage, not at any one person, what? but just Political at the fantasy. situation, uh, at the uh, way the world was and ought to be changed. I don't know anything about this play. I don't know anything about this woman. I told my wife tonight. I said, Dorothy, I don't know what this play is about. I don't know what this woman is about. He, he, he really thought they were the people that he didn't like were, um, I don't, can't say it on television, but uh, he was never depressed, ever. He, he, John got angry instead of depressed, but creatively angry. I'm sick to death of hearing how old this woman is. Who gives a damn how old this woman is? Does she win or does she lose? That's what I want to know. I know. Is that such a lousy question? I know, I know. I'm I beginning know. to feel guilty for asking for guests. I... But he could really, he could really get very angry. A big deal, John got mad at me. I got mad at John, too. 
Yeah, he was angry with me because I was stupid. John loved me like no, well, John, John loved me a lot, like no man ever loved me. True. During the late 70s, I got, yeah, I got a little involved in drugs. I got in trouble, I went to jail. But they say, I was the kind of hard-headed guy that had to do everything myself in my way. And I didn't always listen to people. But uh, John, I think more than angry with me, got hurt that I hurt myself. During Cassavetti's 27-year-long career as a director, he brought forth 11 feature films. Their catapults of sentiments, a shower of emotions that one rarely forgets. Mom, you gotta call me a cab. No. I have to get to the club. No, you stay home. He was a man possessed. Possessed and obsessed to make a film. That was like the necessity of breathing for a human being with John. He was a real artist. He was a very inventive and creative guy, and he made everybody feel that you had to push the medium a bit further. I think he changed everything forever. He was way ahead of his time. Way ahead of his time. I know you're frightened that I'm going to go too far in, in the wrong direction. You're afraid I'm going to make a fool of myself, aren't you? No. You're afraid that somehow my behavior is going to undermine you. Don't meddle. He was a genius, a special genius. He had total recall. Everything he saw as a kid, as a mature person, Everything he heard was totally recalled to him. I get angry at him sometimes because he's not here. I got a vault inside me that has all these memories to come back to tell me who, who I am and what I was. just liked a very complex, very complex uh, picture with many, many, many layers of emotion and contradictions and questions and seeking answers. In 1989, John Cassavetes died at age 59. We all had forgotten especially myself, that John, years ago, made a film for MGM. It was being shot in Acapulco, Mexico, and the whole company came down with uh, hepatitis. So whether his liver trouble came through a period of drinking, I don't know. But eventually that takes its toll, you know. Montezuma's Revenge. The 11 films he directed stay behind, hopefully, his unspoken message will continue to inspire people to live life, filmmakers to go against the tide. Although I've never known John, I often hear his voice talking to me, the advice of Rebel Maverick. I don't think the American mass audience recognized Cassavetes yet. The people, what, did, what do the people know? Who do they know? They know Arnold Schwarzenegger. That's what they know. I like Arnold. Uh, I don't know him, but I like that he's making so much money. He has nice muscles, etc. But that's what they know. That's what the people know. So should you respect the people? Who should care about the people? Well, I think the American audience has, has been sort of TV'd out. They've seen so much stuff now that 
it takes a lot to wake them up to go to see something that's uh, out, of, out of the mainstream. The public always catches up, but in time. It takes them time. It happens often that an uh, artist is uh, least understood in his own country. Whether it's Louis Armstrong, or uh, Orson Welles, or John Cassavetes, three very, very important American artists, all of them basically misunderstood. You know, I said once that, uh, that extraordinary people look at something and see th three things, and that the average person only sees one. And John could see ten. Would you tell the stories? Jenna said, no tears. Remember, no tears. Placing blame elsewhere in subterranean um, spots, for example, and and uh, just generally having a good time when the world around you is falling apart. It's been very important to me. That bitch used to let you have it. <laughs> My man killer, he's so tough, he used a power drill to floss his teeth. Can I get an amen? Gotta get it going now. Can I get an amen? Amen! amen. amen. All, right. All, right. All right, brothers. We are gathered here today on this sorrowful occasion yes, to pay homage to the Dewey and the Deportator. Amen. He was yeah, Dewey yeah, yeah, yeah. and Deported. Yeah. The nigga did. <laughs> Boy, come over here and give Geraldine the big kicks. You not going out your mind, child? What you say, girl? You say you want to marry me. If I wanted to marry somebody, I'd marry myself. The devil made me do it, honey. The bitch used to let you have it. I don't remember how it goes. Flip Wilson took flying lessons in my hometown. He was learning to fly an ultralight plane. And on his first takeoff, he totally went off the runway, crashed into two Piper Cubs, and that was the extent of his whole flying lessons. My man killer, he's so tough. He's as tough as Thanksgiving turkey on Christmas. Hey, hey, look, you don't know me. Flip who? You know, I will tell my boyfriend, and he'll come down and he'll get you. He will beat you up. <laughs> Flip Wilson. That motherfucker owes me ten dollars. He's on the judge. He's on the judge. What you see is what you get. No, I don't know what happened to him. Flip Wilson, eight here. Tom Jones, y'all know him? Yeah. What's new, Pussycat? Whoa, whoa, whoa. Yeah, what happened? Did he get killed? No, he's yeah. like, he's doing the Vegas thing. Oh, he, he goes to Vegas and Reno and does the shows there. Oh, he do? Yeah. I never see him on television. Yeah, no, 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 he had that show too, right around the same time Flip Wilson had his TV show. Yeah. In the early 1970s. That's right. Hmm? My man killer, he's so tough, he can go to Rudy's chicken lips and not throw up. Some fella named Tom Jones, an airplane fell with him or something and killed him. This is just my little baby right here. Ooh, it's just the sweetest little thing. What do you say is what you get? 
I'm sorry that NBC canceled a series. He's a good comedian, man. He's the best I've ever seen in my whole life. Wife tells him, the devil made me buy this dress. I said, I'm not buying no dress, devil. And he pulled the gun. Crushes on your case. 